I did a round table discussion on the 8th of this month and that is uploaded on Spreaker as well and it is an hour long episode so if you're interested in listening to um, some educational professionals from around the world I encourage you to go on Spreaker or YouTube and or SoundCloud and also listen to that particular round table it's the second round table that we've done and I was the host for round table two and my co-host, Erica Hansen, was the uh, host for Roundtable 1. So with that said, we're going to take a short break, and I hope that you join us after the break. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group, educational resources to help reach your goals. This podcast is brought to you by Silicon Valley High School. The world's fastest growing, video-based, self-paced, teacher-supported, fully accredited online school that's recommended by more than 96% of students. Take individual courses at just $95 each or earn your high school diploma at any age. Check us out at svhs.co. Welcome back. I'm your host, Buffy Williams, and you're listening to the New Heights Educational Group, the New Heights Show on Education. And tonight's topic is the Global Education Monitoring Report 2020. And just before the break, I gave a synopsis of the report and the things that they're actually focusing on within this particular report. And some of the principles um, that are involved in this um, examination of education and the um, global movement towards bettering education is uh, some of the inclusive concepts that, you know, all the countries must take into account. They need to look at the needs of the poor, of course, and the most disadvantaged within our population. And that includes, you know, when we're looking at um, our disadvantage, it's no longer, you know, one segment group. Because if we're looking at this from a global perspective, we have, you know, children who are working. We have children um, who live in remote areas um, or who are even nomads or um, have ethnic or linguistic um, minorities in a particular country or a particular area, which means it may not be their native tongue. And then you have, you know, younger people. You have adults who are affected um, by conflict. Uh, we have our HIV and AIDS population and our population of um, those who are hungry and in poor health. And then, of course, those who have special learning needs. And so when we think about um, education and being inclusive, all of those um, disadvantaged populations are involved within that and, and thinking about how we can be uh, have principles that are non-discriminatory and also provide um, support for these populations. Of course, we know we have rights for persons with disabilities and they have, you know, policies that uh, are of course, um, without discrimination or discrimination based and promote equal opportunity for being inclusive within the educational system at all levels. But as we define uh, inclusive for education and looking at it with a global dialogue and thinking about how are these concepts understood is it a narrow focus on students with disabilities or are we looking at it from a broader meeting that encompasses all learners and focuses on policy, 
um, that makes some groups more vulnerable um, or feel like they're excluded from education because, you know, that has been um, part of the framework that they're discussing as well. And it focuses on a, a full range of participation from all countries um, to look at the most vulnerable of our population and those that are at risk or marginalized by, you know, what we consider inclusive education. And we also want to understand within the report that they're explaining that once they are included, that that's not the ending, that's not the end all be all or the end point for where you should go with education. Okay, now that we've included them, now what are we going to do is what the report addresses. And so um, a lot of the things, um, they're not restricted to questions about strictly education. Um, it also involves a range of elements that are um, talk about the educational experiences and what that outcome is going to be. And also, you know, what is going to be the educational content? What is going to be the learning material that the students will use? Um, teaching teachers to be prepared for being more inclusive and looking at the infrastructure and the learning environment that, that the students will be in. And also, what are the community norms uh, globally uh, in these communities? And also having an available space for dialogue and criticism um, so that they can look at are the textbooks promoting one ethnic group above another, or does it contain discriminatory content? And how can it be more equitable and fair uh, across the board for all cultures globally? And so two of the other um, highlights, um, some or some of the other highlights that they have within the report uh, include the divergence between um, inclusive education and you know how it's been um, criticized and the lack and the lack of conceptual focus um, and looking at the key differences uh, in interpreting can this difference be implemented I mean can you know these differences across these cultural and global spectrums, can they actually be implemented? You know, we have this focus and we say that we're going to look at all of the elements and how we can educate across the world. But um, is this something that we can actually merge together and do? Uh, and keeping in mind that there are going to be barriers based on the different um, geographic locations of the schools and of the students and taking a broader view at education and looking at the universal support that we can give students um, and thinking about all students who are at risk and definitely students with disabilities and how can we include them in mainstream classes and not assume that everything that they have available to them that they have the adequate resources, you know, can um, this transition can be difficult, especially for the most vulnerable of our populations, because sometimes people, when we institute policy, we think that once the policy is instituted, then there's going to be this major swift change and change happens slowly. Policy is something that drives it. Yes. But um, it's partially a mindset. You know, people have to get their minds wrapped around. What are these changes we're making? Why are we making these changes? It, getting a clear understanding of what the concepts are and where we're trying to move forward so that everyone is working on um, the, as, as closely related to the same page as possible. And recognizing, you know, that there will be differences and there will be challenges that will be faced. But as long as you're working towards providing inclusive education and you're adjusting and making uh, adjustments uh, according to the recommendations that come forth from parents and community leaders and stakeholders and uh, everyone involved, the school systems and administrators, 
and looking at those recommendations and, of course, um, making adjustments as those concerns or maybe even feedback that these things are working um, come forward. And so um, the report also addresses the different dimensions and degrees and, uh, and elements of inclusion, you know, related to the different communities. It talks about the interpersonal relationships and the informal groups and formal groups, the classroom structure, classrooms, schools, and communities. But it also looks at the different dimensions of the physical, uh, social groups, um, psychological aspects, what is perceived as inclusion by the student, and what is perceived as exclusion by the student. And also systematically, you know, things that affect uh, the most vulnerable population, as I noted, you know, such as fees, and, you know, if, if the students are part of a migrant family or a refugee family, uh, are, are there barriers there because they don't have the proper documentation that they need in order to be educated within the actual system? And then some of the um, final elements that they talk about are the national and legal frameworks regarding education policy and governance and how are we going to finance it? Definitely the curriculum and the learning materials and also the facilities and infrastructure that go along with getting the community involved and having all the necessary agreement ingredients for this um, suggested framework <laughs> to work. And also, um, you know, they're looking at the final report, you know, to examine the role and the different elements, again, as it relates to the support of this inclusional policy, as it relates to, you know, because it's, it's always helpful when you have governance um, backing you and uh, looking at local inclusion of the learners and who is vulnerable within this particular segment and how geographically it can be balanced um, in any situation that brings about um, some disparities there. And so if you're looking for a report that looks at not only education locally, but a global look, uh, again, at education, this is a report that comes out. And uh, again, it is... Uh, independent project and the source is um, the United Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization and so I encourage you to um, go online it is a free report that you can look at the framework for yourself and look at the roles in which um, this report um, analyzes the role of you know the legal tools that are needed to support the development of this um, educational structure that they're proposing in a more inclusive educational system and looking at it from an international perspective. And so um, it also sets the stage um, and because we can't very well talk about education reform without looking at the contextual backdrop, and I did allude to that earlier. So it does mention the U.S.'s um, 1954 Brown versus Education of Topeka County decision, which was a landmark case um, for civil rights. And so looking at going forward, you have to also look at the past and look at your past, maybe missteps and how we were not able to provide uh, inclusion and equity, equity to students. And so, you know, if if our governance is weak, then it can prevent and impede policy and how we're going to move forward within uh, our educational systems. And we also have to take into account that our teachers and our school leaders need our support. And um, any of these formulas are going to need funding, and so we need to be in support of education, our educational leaders, and motivate our teachers um, to be able to um, uh, implement these things because there will be structural barriers and, you know, give them the autonomy that they need to be able to adapt the curriculum, to be able to have the support that they need as far as 